Hi, and welcome back to the Professor Said series on physics. Today, we'll be looking at the Casimir effect. So I'll start off by introducing the ideas behind it. So it was thought of by Henrik Casimir in 1933. He wanted to establish the idea of energy and how it can be associated with having a negative value. He conducted an experiment, which I'll talk about later, and the experiment proved to be successful. And what he found was energy can and does have an, can have a negative value. And it was measured in 1948 by Henrik Casimir and then again later on in 1996 by another physicist named Stephen Lamoureux. So it was named after Henrik Casimir and therefore was called the Casimir effect. And it uses some of the most bizarre ideas associated with quantum mechanics. This being the idea that empty space, an area of nothingness, can be full of particles at any given moment of time. And these particles are given a special name, and they're called virtual particles. And it's, it's a very weird concept to have a space of nothingness, and then that space be full of particles appear and then disappear, appear and disappear, randomly, all the time, at every point in this empty space. So an empty space in a vacuum is not entirely empty, it's actually full of virtual particles. How can this be then? How does it actually happen? Well using something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it can be shown that yes, it is possible. Uncertainty does take over the universe and is a key component in reality. Uncertainty is the reason as to why the Casimir effect is even possible and a reason as to how these particles come about doing this. The idea for that is that they are using energy however the energy is borrowed it is not sustained within the particle, it does not keep it, it's, it's, it's borrowed and then returned to reach an equilibrium once more it is believed to be borrowed from the immediate future. So if we take two metal plates, so let's take a metal plate to be here, and we'll take another metal plate to be here. And we'll then say that these are separated by a distance of some length r. And we'll say that r is a very small distance. It, it, the actual Casimir effect only occurs at very small distances, but we can assume that R is just any distance, but it's just small. Now there's two key factors that we need to take into account in this experiment, and that's to remove two components of forces within our system here, the system of two metal plates. And first of all is to make sure that their mass is very small. So we can make sure that these plates are very thin. So we can say that they are very thin and therefore their mass is very low. And what what else is the, um, that needs to be considered is to make sure that there, that there is no charges on these plates. So we can earth these charges I mean these plates, sorry, and that would ensure that there is no loose charges on these plates. And the reason we make sure that the mass is very thin, I mean the, the plates are very thin, so therefore the mass is low, is to ensure that there is no gravitational um, pull between the two plates, as we have already assumed that they are at very small distances of R. And the reason we um, have to earth these plates is to sh uh, um, ensure that there is no electric static forces between them two plates that could be attracting or repelling each other. So once these two factors are considered, the final component that also needs to be considered is to put the actual system into a vacuum. A vacuum. As we have seen, the existence of virtual particles can only really occur in high densities in empty space where they can be more measurable. So if we take them to 
metal plates that came, which we have earthed and made sure their mass is negligible. And we situate these on a small wheel wheeled platform. So if we just draw a platform with some wheels, and again we draw the same over here. So they they're movable. They can move, but they are in a vacuum and they are definitely stationary. And we can we can just assume that all of this space around here is the vacuum chamber. No, there is n it's a complete total vacuum. There is nothing else in this chamber. So what you find now is something very incredible. You find that these virtual particles that exist in this vacuum, um, let's say they are popping up everywhere, so just popping up all the time everywhere. And we also know that these particles have an associated wave to them. So if we, if we say that's the particle and we said, okay, what's the associated wave with this particle? Well, we can say, well, it has a wave of that and then we draw another particle say okay what's the particle let's, let's say this is a green particle here and we say what's the wave associated with the green particle well it has a wave of this each one has a different wave and the different possibilities of waves are an infinite amount of possibilities and that's crazy to have that many different possibilities but uncertainty does say that there are every possibility is accountable and that's the same for virtual particles every possibility of a quantum mechanical wave for these particles exists however between these two plates here only a certain amount of waves can fit within these two uh, uncharged plates and by this I mean half wavelengths can fit within these two plates. And if we say that n is the number of wavelengths, every half multiple is equal to a k amount of wavelengths. So within these two plates, we can have a half wavelength, we can have a two half wavelength, which will become two over two, which is one, we can then have a 3 over 2 wavelengths. So every half multiple exists within these two plates. And that is all the way up to infinity. So you can have an infinite amount of half possible wavelengths within there. But then what about outside the two charge plates? Well, outside the two charge plates, we have a larger space. Therefore, the, the possibility of the amount of wavelengths existing with here must be higher. You can have a higher wavelength. It does no longer doesn't need to be n over 2 no more. It can be any value higher than n over 2. Therefore, outside here, we also have waves of mechanical quantum mechanical probability waves, all different, all with different wavelengths, all larger than between the two plates and this is what's amazing the high the let me bring it down here a bit so the actual probability of waves between the two charge plates so let's let's say these um, um, the probability of the two charge plates is here so in between here we have all the probabilities here and then outside so all the space existing around the two charge plates are again quantum mechanical waves of probability but a higher amount but inside the two charge plates we've already established that there are an infinite amount of probabilities so what can be greater than infinity another infinity <laughs> they're outside the two charge plates there, there exists a higher infinity than what exists between the two charge plates. And you might say, well, how can an infinity be larger than another infinity? Well, the infinity, let's say, of the real number sequence, which goes up as 1, 2, 
three, and so on. That's smaller than the infinity of the decimals, as every decimal has a new could have a new new number within every single point of decimal place. So let's say we have one, two, three, four, and so on. We can end up having one, three, two, four, and that starts a whole new sequence. So it's crazy to think how many infinities exist within this, let alone it what exists within this. So the infinities are different. We have two different types of infinities. And the reason the, the reason why the infinity between the two plates is smaller is something beca uh, called the boundary conditions. Um, the two plates cause a boundary that only allows certain wavelengths to exist within the two particles. And that's explained more in quantum mechanics just using uh, the ideas of waves. But we're not looking to that right now. So this is what the Casimir effect uses it uses the idea of two different infinities and then what happens is as you have two different values of infinity the infinity outside we'll call it infinity um, L for large and then we'll say the infinity in here is L for small as that's a larger infinity you have that acting across the two plates it's as if you're pouring let's say we had a bucket of water and you will pour in water from either side and then you had two sort of plastic sheets that were stuck into the bucket as the water fills up we can assume that this water in between the two plastic plates is, is zero there is no water between them because here we see that this infinity is larger than this infinity and it's, it could be as if this infinity was acting as a zero for example these two plates will then start to push together the pressure from these two plates I mean the pressure from these from the water acting on both sides begins to push the two plates together as if, as if it was getting squeezed and that's again what happens here these two plates then start to move together and as we said we left them on a wheelie system over here the two wheels will then start to move together and you start getting these two plates to move. Now there was no real force acting upon these two plates. There was nothing there pushing it. There was no gravitational force. There was no electromagnetic force. Yet they still moved from the differences in infinities of the probable quantum waves of the particles on uncertainties that were causing these two plates to move together the virtual particles were appearing in and out causing sort of ripples of disappearing and appearing energy that was uncertain and the amount of these uncertainties rise to infinity which was a different infinity and that's amazing that two different values of infinity due to just imaginary well not imaginary sorry virtual particles can cause real life large apparatus to move together and as they move from a standstill this is called negative energy and the effect that causes this is called the Casimir effect Casimir effect and negative energy in itself is such a weird idea what can be less than zero it's it's like what what is minus one what is less than nothingness how can you have any less we can understand what positive energy is you fill up a a petrol tank in your car and all of that energy is then used to move the car but how can the car move if there was no energy how, how can it move if it had less than zero energy? How can it move by itself on a flat... How can it move by itself on a flat surface just on its own accord? How can it just go like that? 
it's it's really weird to think that things can just move from a standstill because we're so used to the idea that you have to push things or do things for things to actually move or to tr to transfer a, an energy. So the Casimir effect is such an abstract abstract concept that it's also used for very abstract physics, and it's therefore it's used in the physics of negative matter. And something also very amazing, the physics of Einstein-Rosen bridges, which was also known as wormholes. And I shall be talking to you about that in my next episode. So I'd like to say thank you for watching. We've, we've come to the end of our second episode. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, please like and subscribe the video. And I hope again to see you soon. In the meantime, you can check out these other two videos here again I've posted on different topics on physics. And thank you again for watching. Bye.